Today, we're going to continue the discussion about the obligation to move to Israel. And in this part, I'm going to bring you sources that it is a commandment to live in Israel. I'm also going to discuss who is exempt from living in Israel, who is allowed to leave Eretz Israel, and we shall begin. It says in Masechet Ketuvot, one should always live in Eretz Israel, even in a city where the majority are idol worshippers, rather than living outside of Eretz Israel, where there is a majority of Jews. Whoever lives in Eretz Israel is like someone who has a God, and whoever lives outside of Eretz Israel is like is like someone who has no God. As it says in Vaikra, to give you the land of Canaan to be a God for you. As we know, it the person who lives in Israel, he has bigger reward for keeping the mitzvot. He the the air makes one wise. We see that the that the strongest Torah scholars, the, the smartest Torah scholars, are living in the land of Israel. And we see also that the children who learn in Israel in Torah studies are, are much more advanced than the ones that are outside of Eretz Yisrael. There's an interesting halakha in the, in the Mishnah that says that a husband who wants to move to Israel and his wife doesn't, and the husband is still at him. He's like, no, I'm going no matter what. You want to come with me? You don't want to come with me? I'm going. And she's like, I don't care. I'm not going. He can give her, he has to give her a divorce and he doesn't have to pay the ketubah settlement. And also, if the wife wants to go to Israel and he doesn't, they force the husband to divorce her if she's adamant about still going to Israel. And also, uh, same thing along the lines of, of a husband who wants to leave Israel and the wife doesn't and vice versa. Now, if the, the mitzvah to live in Israel doesn't exist today or doesn't exist because there is no Bet HaMikdash or there is no prophecy, how can the Chachamim enact such a halacha? It can only be that this mitzvah, the commandment to live in Eretz Israel, still exists. And it's not dependent on, on the Bet HaMikdash or anything else. And this is further mentioned by many halachic authorities that everything that's along these lines that is said in the Mishnah are for all times and they do not just apply to a certain time period. Such as, you know, there are certain laws that, that only apply if most of the Jews are in the land of Israel, or if there's a Sanhedrin, or there's a Bet HaMikdash, but not this one. And uh, some of the authorities that bring this halacha is uh, Shulchan Aruch. We also see that the Rambam, the Rosh, and the Rif all say that, the, that this law in the Mishnah is a mitzvah for all times. The Ramban says something very interesting in Sefer Mitzvot. We were commanded to occupy the land that God gave to our ancestors, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We must not abandon it to any other nation or leave it desolate. I want to stop at that part. Or leave it desolate. That means, you know, these people don't want to come to Israel. And they could, easily. If you're right, that we shouldn't live in Israel, we don't have to. If we all thought like you, we'll be leaving the land desolate. Someone else would be controlling it. So, Baruch Hashem, we didn't think like you because people like us who stayed in Israel and went through the hardship, in the beginning, some hardship, because Ereti said, Niknebe Yisurin, the land of Israel is acquired through suffering. It's not so easy in the beginning. It could be a short period. There's a story about the Baba Sali. He came to Israel and he settled and he, he really, he said it. He had, it was very easy for him to adjust to Israel right from the beginning. And many people came and asked him, they said, how did you adjust so easily? We're having a very, very hard time adjusting here. 
So he asked them, how did you come from Morocco to, to Israel? And they said, yeah, we, we jumped on a plane and we came. He says, do you know how I came to Israel? You know how much I suffered? He came by horse, by camel, or walking. He, they, they, that's how he came from Morocco to Israel. It was very hard for him. But he did it. He went through that suffering. And now when he came to Israel, everything was smooth for him. He didn't have... He was happier than ever. So, I'm going to continue with the, the Ramban. It is thus a positive precept for all time. And every single Jew is obligated in this even during the exile as the Talmud is known to state in many places. This is what the Ramban says word for word. The mitzvah for all, all times to live in Eretz Yisrael and not to leave it desolate. The Rambam, around 800 years ago, came with his family to see Eretz Yisrael and they, they considered living here. He came to a community where there was only a small number of families living there and he saw the great poverty there. In addition, he saw that all the families in that area that he, he visited, they were all being supported from the diaspora. People were sending money that they would be able to sustain themselves because the poverty was so strong in, in Israel at the time. So Rambam, he, he, you know, he said to himself, if we also live here, we're only going to decrease the percentage of what they're getting. And the poverty was so so hard at that time so they went back he went back to Egypt that's where he was living at the time and he was allowed to do that because the poverty was very high and we'll see a, a halakha that discusses this idea in Tosefta what does that it says one should not leave Eretz Yisrael unless the cost of wheat rises to two se'a for a sella. let's just explain that for a second Isaiah is a, is a measurement. So it's talking about measurement of wheat. And a sela is a, was a monetary unit at the time, in, in, uh, back in the day. A sela was, was the amount that a laborer could make for his daily wage. That's, it could be that, that amount. So if we're seeing that two seahs cost a day's worth of work, then that means the prices have gone up very high and it's going to be very hard to live in Israel. And then a person can leave Eretz Yisrael. However, Rabbi Shimon says this refers to where one lacks the wherewithal to buy it. But if he has the wherewithal, then even if one seah is... One seah of wheat costs one seah, he should nevertheless not leave Eretz Yisrael. So that means... If he has the, he's a man of means and he can afford this inflation, high prices, then he is not allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael. So people who use the excuse, oh, I'm poor, I don't have money, that does not apply today anymore. Almost all people, they have a roof on their head, there's electricity, there's heating, you have more than bread and water. You have clothing. You have you have hot meals. You might not have you know a poor person in Israel might not have as much as a middle class or a richer person, but he's doing much better than than you think. Especially the poor of today did well, probably lived much better than the rich of the past or or the same the same level. So. That is not, you know, that is not a reason to go to Israel. And another reason you're allowed to go to Israel is if you are a, I'm going to bring it right now, in Yechavedat, it brings these examples. You're a businessman. You go to Japan or whatever. I don't want to say Japan anymore. But, uh, you go, in, you go to a businessman, you go, you go every like few months, you come back. That's fine. You go a little bit, you do your business deals, and you come back. You're not living there. 
ולבד שיהיה על מנת לחזור לארץ בהקדם. As long as you return to ארץ ישראל, אבל להשתקע בחוץ לארץ, אסור. But to, to end up living in חוץ לארץ because of your business, because you know in your business, if you open a business in America and you live there, you're going to be making millions, whereas here or not, that's not a reason to live at, leave ארץ ישראל. ואסור לצאת מארץ ישראל לטייל. אפילו על מנת לחזור לארץ ישראל. You want to go on a vacation. You know, it's interesting. I'm not going to say any names, but one of the, the first corona, coronavirus victims was an Israeli who went to an Asian country for his, yeah, like a, I don't know, 20th anniversary or something like that. He went with like some of his family members. He's an older person. And he goes there, he got coronavirus, he was in quarantine, he got stuck there for a while until they let him out, and then he came back to Israel. Yeah, that's what happens. I, I wish him refuah shlema, I hope he feels better. Probably by now he is, because it's already been a few weeks. Um, but uh, that's what happens, he wasn't, he's not allowed to leave for that reason, to go to, to you know, China, Japan, Korea, whatever it is. ומותר לצאת לחוץ לארץ ללמוד תורה, ללמד תורה ולישא אישה על מנת לחזור. So, you want to go teach Torah, you be, you know, you're going to become a rabbi of the community, you're going to open up a yeshiva, and there's a need for it, and they sent you to do that, or people who spread Judaism, the professionals who do that. That it, then you are allowed to go to Israel and also, uh, so you have to leave Israel to do that and also to get a wife. And that means that you tried here in Israel to get a wife and nothing's working. You go there, you found somebody, you have to go there for them, for dating or to, to marry her. Um, <clears throat> or some people, they have like, the, you know, they invite rabbis to come from Israel as guest speakers. They have events, that's fine. He goes there, he does his thing, and he comes back. Another reason, people do shlichut. They do, they, they go on a mission to collect money for their institutions, for their yeshivot. They're allowed to leave Israel to do that. Again, they have to come back. However, it says in the end, the as yachzol eretz yisrael. So if you're you're a rabbi of a community and then you retired, you were in like you know a diaspora. Your job is finished. You're not the rabbi anymore. You have to come back right away. So I don't. That's why I don't understand that a lot of the people who go there they used to be rabbis or they used to be teachers and now they're retired and they stayed. And not only that. The rabbi of the community is supposed to tell his congregants throughout the years about the beauty of Israel and to encourage them either little by little or not little by little, fast, to, to come right away to Israel. So I don't understand why that's not being spoken about enough, at least publicly. Um, I've heard firsthand of communities that the rabbi got up, he said, everybody... We are moving to Eretz Yisrael. We're planning everything. Who's coming with me? And almost all of the synagogue came with the rabbi and they moved to Israel together. What a beautiful thing. I met someone from that community. It was in New York. Another reason that you're allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael, Kibud Avayim, one who wants to visit his parents, he's allowed to do so. And let me see if there's another one mentioned here. These are the main ones. And, and I don't think that most people fall under that category. What is your excuse not to come to Israel right now? If you, fall, if you, don't, if you don't fall in that category, you should be here right now. I would like to add this point. juncture 
just mention a few of the expulsions that the Jews had throughout the years. And I want to tell you that history repeats itself. And wherever you may be right now, know that it's going to come to your country also. God forbid. But that's, that's what's been going on. We see that... Yeah, I'll just bring a few dates. In 19 CE, Tiber Tiberius ordered the expulsion of all the Jews of Italy if they would not abandon their faith. In 50 CE, Claudius expelled them from Rome. Uh, the expulsion from England, 1290, where 16,000 Jews were removed from its borders until 1650. Expulsions of France, 1306, 1394, and they only returned in 1789. The famous Spanish Inquisition, 1492 to 1497, and after that, they also were exiled. When they went to Portugal, they got exiled again. We have, uh, during the time of the Black Death, in 1348, the Jews, the Jews were expelled from many places in Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, Jews were prohibited from living in Russia from the 15th century until 1772. There was another expulsion in Lithuania, 1495, Prague, 1744 to 1752. Um, I can go on and on. I just wanted to bring those. There, there also were some reasons. There are some cases that it didn't have to do with an expulsion. The Jews just escaped. That's what happened in many of the Middle Eastern countries. After 1948, the Arab countries wanted the Jews out. They made life very hard for them. And the Jews got up and left, most of them, without their property, with nothing in their hands. They were either kicked out or they ran away. As Also in Iran, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, all these places, the Sephardic Jews had to leave everything and they, they came out of uh, those countries. Some came to Israel and some didn't. We see history repeating itself again and again. Why do you think that it won't happen in America? Why do you think what happened in France again? There was one in France, as I mentioned, England. Um, and this reminds me, you know, I was when I was a child, I was in the, the Holocaust Museum and I remember that uh, they had like a photo of the, the victims and there was a button you can press on each picture that described, it was like a dialogue, and not a real one, it was a made up dialogue about what the people spoke about at those times. And I remember that they were having the conversation and one said to the other, well, you know, no one's gonna take Hitler seriously. It's gonna, it's gonna get, we're gonna get by. It's not a big deal. It's gonna pass. And unfortunately, we saw that that wasn't true. So these are the sources. I didn't bring every single one. Um, so I ask, if I'm wrong, please tell me. I've, I've yet to see someone say that anything that I've said here is wrong. Thank you for listening.